Welcome back. Now, a very special story. Rare access inside the Carmelite Monastery in Christchurch. Women, nuns, separated from the world and their families behind high walls. Hours of silence and prayer, a life of poverty, chastity and obedience. It's another world. And after 10 years of consideration, they agreed to talk openly about their lives with Sunday producer Chris Cook. They asked, however, that he enter the monastery alone. When I was younger, I would have never have seen myself as a nun, ever, 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 ever. I was Catherine Smith, and now I am Sister Catherine of Christ, a Carmelite novice. I've been here since 2014. I became a Catholic when I was 18 years old. I felt God asked me to be here a mysterious call to a life of prayer for others. There was some fear, can I live the life? My name is Sister Kushla. I'm called the Novice Mistress. Glory be to the Father. I provide academic formation and I need to present the demands of the life. We think of shaping ourselves to his way of living. As we are following Christ who was poor, chaste and obedient. So we're actually trying to live an imitation of him. When I was a teenager, I really wanted to marry and have a large family. That was my dream. I came to do a school project on the Carmelites. And there was something that attracted me about them, but also something about the whole idea that repulsed me. I took away the, the pamphlets and over the years I developed this love-hate relationship with them. Pray for us, Holy Mother of God. Pray for us. We see prayer as, as embracing the whole world. And to me, embracing the world was a, was a really big thing for me. My name is Sister Dorothea Wilkes, prioress of this Carmelite monastery. It was the last thing in the whole world I would have expected to be here. I was 28 when I entered the monastery and I had a very full life, perhaps the best and the worst of life. I was living a sort of happy life because I didn't believe in God at all. I thought Christians were really soft in the head. I couldn't bear Christians. I had a, a huge experience of God when I was 19. That turned my life around overnight. It was at a huge rock concert. A Black Sabbath rock concert up in Narawahia. The music was pounding into me and there was a burning cross on the hill. I started to see all my life going in front of my eyes. I knew that there was something not quite true in that life. It's not something true in drugs. There's not something true in relationships that are not wholly pure relationships. But I didn't want to do this anymore. So that's when I started to set my sights on the contemplative life to pray for others, that they would be also liberated from the things that were binding me to living a life that was not a happy life. People might think that you have to be a pure Catholic virgin to be able to become a nun. That's not how God works. It's not the Carmelites who determine who comes. God determines who comes and who is called. In Carmel, we begin our day with prayer at 6 a.m. Getting up early every day is challenging, especially in winter. It's our first time of prayer, which we have seven times a day. Well, all during the day, the bells ring to call us to prayer. Then we have the two silent hours of prayer. God talks in silences. He, he's, there's a, an amazing depth to that silence. You just love to be in the silence. We're involved with people ringing for prayer, ringing, writing, always asking for intercessory prayer. We say it together. Hail Mary. That's one of our biggest works, you might say, is replying to those people and praying for them. I believe that our prayer here does have an impact on the outside. We have to live by faith because we usually don't see the results of our prayer. 
What defines monastic life for us is the separation from the world, symbolised by the physical wall that we have around our monastery. It's also the grills that we have in our chapel, separating us from the public. So the public can't see you at all? No. You're hidden? We're hidden. We usually only see our family and friends once a month. Hello, how are you? I can't hug them, yeah, yeah that's right, but we weren't actually big huggers in our family anyway. <laughs> You're not the first person I see. Most of my family are not Catholic, oh, so it was a huge thing for them to take on. The big thing was leaving the family. That was the hardest reality. And they're not Catholic, so you can imagine that wasn't easy for them. I was raised Presbyterian. My father is a Presbyterian minister. He's now retired. It doesn't make any sense to them, especially that I miss out on family events. When I first came, I saw the wall of the monastery and was rather intimidated, excited but a bit nervous. What have I got myself into? I was greeted with open arms. When the door closed behind me, I, I felt like I was on another planet. A while later, when I first walked into the room to dress me in the habit, there was two pairs of scissors. And that's the first time I realised that my hair was going to be cut, which took me by surprise a little bit. But I wasn't worried. That symbolises a letting go of any attachments I have to impressing others. A letting go of myself, in a way. In that moment of receiving the habit, I felt very at peace, and that peace surprised me, and that peace hasn't left me. It was very moving. Until my solemn vows, I wear this white for about five years. Taking the final vows, the solemn vows, in the monastery, for me, would mean that I am completely dedicating myself to God in this way of life forever. And as far as I can tell, I will. But God's will be done. So you may not stay? I may not. What do you give up to be here? The deep friendship that can exist between a man and a woman. You give up that for the sake of God. Is that something you think about? Yes. It becomes a, a kind of a, a gentle rhythm throughout the day of coming to prayer, of getting into our work. I found it rather exhausting to begin with, and on a Saturday you seem to clean the whole monastery. We've got gardens and we've got orchards, and they supply a lot of what we need. Come on. Our stairs, they help keep the grass down. Hello. I enjoy coming out here. It's sort of, I'm often just out here by myself. It's a different means of thinking of God and of being with him and of being grateful for what he gives us and how he provides for us. We make the altar breads for many of the parishes in Christchurch. We sell them and they're a bit of income for us. They are the body of Christ, which are consecrated in the Mass. The priest distributes them in communion. Sister, the body of Christ. Confession is available to us every week. In the name of the Father and of the Son. Yes, the every week. <laughs> yes, we actually we don't run out of things. My soul is waiting for the Lord. Christ, We're vegetarians. The first Carmelites gave up meat as a way to be poor. Most of our days spent in silence, and so we come together and we talk. <laughs> Two times a day of recreation for an hour. So it's a very joyful time. It's very rejuvenating. Then that gives us strength to go back into that silence again. I come here many times during the day. It's the one place of the monastery that is reserved just for me. We are not just nuns, but hermits, 
So this is the place where I try and live that out. It's like a desert inside. We don't have the newspapers, we don't have TV, we don't watch the news. You're very much emptied of images and of things that would clutter up your life that, from a life of prayers. We are aware of the issue regarding sexual abuse, abuse in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, oh, we're well aware of it. And oh, that, I think that's been the, one of the biggest, well, a sword in our side for a long time to think that would even be happening. It was just so, it's just, beyond our kin, we couldn't, it's just unreal. So it's an issue that we, just makes our hearts bleed, it's horrible. We have three hermitages on the property. We have our monthly retreat of one day and 10 days once a year. When we separate ourselves to be entirely alone with God. So not only silence, extra silence. Yes. <laughs> yes. Have I ever questioned the sacrifice I've made? Not exactly questioned them, but I've certainly felt the desire for those things that I've left. We give up having, being able to have a family, being able to have your own husband. You can still have those longings. We're still, we're women and we're, we've got many womanly instincts and needs. If we know ourselves and we know why they've given them up, why we've given them up, then it's easy to work through those things. All those things that I wanted from a husband and believed I would get from a husband, I get it in a much deeper, much more spiritual way from Jesus Christ. Through prayer? Through prayer. You give up the possibility of a career, the possibility of a life, a committed relationship with a man, the joys that come with that, the pleasures that come with that. Is that something you think about? Yes. Is it hard? It has its hard moments. I feel sometimes the desire to be in the arms of a man, but not in the sense of longing for something that I don't have or can't have, just pondering the mystery of why me? Why has God called me and why has he put in my heart this desire that he's fulfilling in abundance. Do you ever consider that if there is no heaven, the incredible sacrifice you would have made with your life? You're quite right. If there's no heaven, we've made an enormous sacrifice. In fact, I've said, sometimes said to people, if there's no heaven, I'll be over this wall in two minutes. I'll be out of here. It's only for the sake of, of our eternal life. I know this is where I am myself. This is where I can feel totally who I am. And that, to me, is, is, is everything. So in a few months, Sister Catherine will decide if she's to take the next step towards her vows. We'll keep you posted. And we'd like to thank the nuns for their generosity in sharing their stories.